So let's continue this neuroethic day by a very interesting topic, that is the brain and the law. And for that, we are very uh, pleased to welcome you, Jennifer Chandler. Uh, she's an associate professor at the Faculty of Law of Ottawa in Canada, and she became an expert on uh, neuroethic of law and neural. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for the invitation and for having me in your beautiful, beautiful country and city. I've been enjoying the weather very much. Apparently there were some snowflakes last week, believe it or not, and that's exceptional even for Canada. Um, so people are very grumpy that I'm here and they're there. Uh, okay, so I will be speaking to you. I'm a, I'm a lawyer trained in the, sort of the common law, the sort of Anglo-Saxon, North American, um, Canada, US, uh, a British tradition, but I'm going to try to um, <clears throat> link this to what I know about the civil law tradition as well that, that applies in continental Europe. And we'll have some questions for you, I think, as we go along. Um, but first, let me just introduce the topic. Um, and perhaps if I speak a little too quickly, as I have tendency to do, just wave at me and it will remind me to slow down. I, I will try very hard to moderate the speed. So, neural law. What can this be? Well, we've heard already from several speakers, there's now a neuro everything. It's uh, a la mode, oh, you know, there's a vogue for uh, neuro things. And neuro law is no exception. And this is a, a field that has developed, you can see, just to collect this, this book in, in the uh, light blue is 2003. So this, it's fairly recent that this is starting to take off. And now there is quite a lot of um, writing in the area. A lot of funded research, particularly in the United States, with the MacArthur Foundation Research Network on Law and Neuroscience. Um, and so quite a lot of activity looking at how information coming from the neurosciences uh, might call into question uh, some aspects of legal theory, legal practice, and legal rules. Um, now, I did want to stop for a moment and, by way of schematic, to sort of show you where I'm going to be speaking. One could talk about law and neuroscience in, in two general ways. One could talk about the effect of law on neuroscience. So <clears throat> sort of have the uh, independent and dependent variable set up in that way and ask, well, what could the law say that would be of value to um, neuroscientific research? Well, this could be um, ethical and legal rules related to human subjects research. We could even talk about um, uh, you know, intellectual property, the development of uh, innovations coming from your disciplines that you might want to commercialize, that might have commercial application. So there's intellectual property law. Now, none of these things are terribly novel, I think. This are, these themes and problems are well trodden in the law um, around scientific inquiry generally. Another more controversial question might be, are there some lines of research that should be prohibited? And to even suggest this to scientists probably will cause people to have an allergy. But if you look at certain um, domains, such as in Canada, we prohibit on criminal penalty uh, human cloning, for example. So lines of research are foreclosed sometimes out of fear for what the consequences of those lines of research might be. So that might be an additional question might, one might raise here. Now that's a whole other lecture, um, which I, I won't go into today because what I'd like to do instead is talk about the other direction. <clears throat> How might neuroscience, whether it's in the form of knowledge about human behavior or in the form of technologies, neuroimaging, uh, come to challenge the law or affect uh, legal practice? So this is again huge and I put up here just sort of a, a little bit of an overview of various talks I've given in different areas of this domain, all the way from memory dampening treatment, the effects of propranolol potentially on treatment of PTSD, and the effects that might have on evidence law. If you have, for example, a witness who's had this treatment and whose um, recollection has allegedly been impaired by this treatment, how would that affect um, the judicial decision making? Or we can look at the protection or regulation of transcranial magnetic stimulation or t uh, transcranial direct stimulation, current stimulation, um, and children and the enhancement application uh, of those treatments to children to aid in the acquisition of mathematical or linguistic skills. Um, a whole range of uh, criminal applications as well. Uh, we'll talk in a moment about, quote, psychosurgery, what's been renamed neurosurgery for psychiatric disorders to try to distinguish it from the mid-20th century lobotomy as a whole other area of regulation. 
regulating particular forms of intervention. So let me jump forward. And what I've proposed to lay out for you is six vignettes, six exhibits in legal terms, showing that there might be something interesting that neuroscience is raising for us lawyers and legal practitioners. <clears throat> Some of them are, are actually happening. Others are more uh, prospective and speculative. So first, and I remain sort of at a high level and I'll go down into detail. So the first possible um, thing we could look at is whether the neurosciences, and in particular, I'm thinking of neuroimaging and EEG and other forms of um, sort of detection of brain activity, um, whether they might uh, furnish evidence, so entre guillemets, objective evidence of um, mental states. So the law is very, very interested in mental states. We want to know what your intention was. What's your capacity? Do you feel pain when you, see, you say you feel pain? There's a lot of money wrapped up in determining who actually feels pain when they say they feel pain. Do you remember a certain thing that you claim not to remember? Um, when we're doing dangerousness assessments, um, do you happen to have a sexual interest in children, for example? This is a, a, a major line of inquiry in the context of sentencing of people who have molested children. So if you claim not to be interested, but you are, this is again an aspect of the internal subjective mental state that the law is very interested in. And the pain I've mentioned. Deception, again, of course, is, a, is of great general interest to the law. And a lot of what goes on in the courtrooms is trying to determine the credibility of what someone says. So, Someone's testimony can be non-credible for a variety of reasons. They can be mistaken, they can have a poor memory, or they can be actively deceptive. And here is where the, the neurosciences, this is in development, um, there's various attempts to try to determine whether someone is, is lying, being actively deceptive, by using fMRI and also a form of EEG, known as brain fingerprinting. Now, um, if you were to have time, you could go and Google No Lie MRI as an American company that is marketing this uh, service. And there have been a um, sort of a group of others, one of which is on contract with the Singaporean police force to help them do their investigations. So does this work or not? Well, I, I think it's safe to say this is a sort of an emerging kind of field. Um, it's worthwhile noticing that the uh, psychological research on our ability generally to detect deception is very poor. We're about coin toss, 50% likely to be correct in laboratory conditions. People are more motivated to lie successfully in court, so it may be that our ability is even worse than that. Um, a little, uh, a, uh, sort of the, the title of an article, it's actually a conference presentation, documenting the actual use of a technique, an EEG type of technique, in a couple of dozen cases in India to determine culpability. Now, to my knowledge, this is the only place in the world where these have been accepted by courts. Most judicial systems will have criteria for the admissibility of novel scientific evidence, and it has not yet reached the stage of being regarded as sufficiently valid and reliable for application in the forensic setting. But the interesting thing here is the cases are coming forward almost always at the instance or the demand of accused people who are not being believed. You did such and such a thing, and you say, no, I didn't. Put me in the scanner and I'll show I didn't. So it, it, uh, I suspect there's going to be lots of pressure coming um, to try to prove to people what the real claimed mental state is uh, when they're not believed. Um, OK. <clears throat> so this is, this is sort of where we are now. Um, I think this, all of this raises a more interesting kind of philosophical, social, or, and psychological question, which is who is going to be the authoritative knower of the mental state, the internal state of a person? Because these technologies can purport to tell you about brain states. Well, we want to know, to be dualistic for a moment, we want to know about the mental state. And we can't get access to the mental state, so we're making an inference from the brain state about the mental state. And who gets to have the authoritative epistemological position? And to put it another way, who gets to know the sort of internal contents of the mind? And could we set up a peculiar situation where um, we might have sort of the scientist in the white coat saying, actually, you may feel you're having this mental 
experience, this phenomenon. But in fact, I'm telling you, I know from external objective evidence that it's something other. And I return to this question of memory. There was in the 1990s, uh, um, I don't know if it touched France and continental Europe as much, but there was um, an explosive debate over the nature of um, recovered memories of childhood sexual abuse. And the argument was these were um, suppressed memories, dissociatively suppressed memories, that were then recovered later as an adult. And um, the contrary argument was, no, these were false memories implanted at the suggestion of counselors in troubled people. And there was this huge debate that emerged as to what is this evidence, legitimate evidence of childhood sexual abuse, and it became important in criminal proceedings and in subsequent civil proceedings against counselors for implanting this memory um, in people. And I have seen sporadically papers suggesting that fMRI could be used to distinguish between these false memories versus real memories. Um, I don't think this is anywhere near being sort of useful in the criminal uh, or in the legal context. But I did read one memoir of a woman who had had a, a recovered memory of this type and then later recanted the memory, called a recanter in the terminology, um, who in her memoirs talked about that experience having uh, given her a kind of a radical self-doubt. The experience of having been so persuaded to, that she had had a particular experience only to later be told, no, that's a false memory. Suggest to me this interesting question of what happens when we acquire more and more information about the different aspects of your personal felt subjective experience as being false, whatever that means. So to me, this is launching a sort of a question of, of epistemological authority. And maybe I'm overblowing it. Maybe people will be able to stand in court and say, fine, don't believe me, I know what I felt. But then you have, on the other hand, a woman like the one I described who approaches her whole experience now with a, a form of gingerly caution, uncertain whether what she feels is real or not. And um, jumping back to, uh, or to the last point, pain, I give you a quotation from an old Canadian case where someone with fibromyalgia, a chronic pain condition, um, was said by the court to have a personality disorder, a false uh, experience um, found in indiv individuals who cannot or will not cope with everyday stresses of life and convert it into symptoms, a very unsympathetic kind of uh, interpretation. And a person facing this kind of court reaction, a syndrome that's poorly understood, for which there are no biomarkers, and where there's large incentive to lie, would be very interested in trying to produce this kind of um, brain signature objective evidence um, to buttress the claim. And so what we see now is that's starting to emerge into the case law in the United States too, not so much in Canada, where we have a sort of a different social safety kind of setup and also um, state-funded medical care. So it's not as important to, um, to succeed in a lawsuit as it is in the United States. <clears throat> but it has been discussed recently, or about this time last year, on our national news. And one can also find, um, I find this rather entertaining one, uh, services as well, like the no -Lie MRI, that are emerging and purporting to be able to look at the brain with, I think, EEG in this context, um, to determine objectively on a scale from one to 10 whether you're actually feeling pain or not. <clears throat> I particularly like the little dollar signs in there. I think that means you pay in order to get the, the number at the end, which comes out. Um, another article by Sarah Reardon in Nature uh, is a useful one because this is where she has actually gone and talked to a variety, uh, well, uh, several providers of this kind of um, workup in the United States and has learned that getting this kind of information has led to the settlement of lawsuits, so not going to court anymore, but settling the lawsuit pretrial for a much higher amount of money than was formerly on the table. So this raises interesting questions of, of legal ethics, it, you know, whether or not this kind of science is robust in actually detecting a pain condition, chronic pain condition. Um, people think it is, and therefore there's a market for this kind of um, service that's being provided. So my second ex exhibit or vignette, I'll just check the time here, <clears throat> is sort of another story for you suggesting that neuroscience is prompting the revision of legal rules. And here, um, I, I'll pause for a moment to explain that within um, at least our legal system, one can, without having to try very hard to find it, 
find many instances of rules that are based upon a Cartesian dualism. The mind and the brain are separate. We treat uh, mental phenomena different from physical phenomena. And in our own Mental Health Act, in the province in which I live in Canada, we have the following provision. In section 49, we have a section that says and regulates psychosurgery, and it's defined in the following way. Uh, oh, actually, I don't have it there. It, sorry, I thought I had it quoted for you. I have a paraphrase. It essentially says psychosurgery is an intervention in the brain um, to treat a mental or behavioral problem, not an organic brain disorder. But then it goes on to say, by the way, treatment of pain and epilepsy count as organic. But it doesn't specify whether any other kind of um, mental disorder might be organic or not. And this essentially uh, creates this funny line down the middle of potential interventions, surgical interventions, which are defined to include deep brain stimulation, um, whereby if you are treating anything where the biological sort of underpinnings of a condition are not known, you're not organic. You're in the realm of psychiatry and mental disorder, and you are under the law being regulated. On the other hand, if you can point to a biological explanation of a behavioral or mental condition, then you have an organic brain disorder. Now, I think uh, the problem is, in essence, this will, is, is clear, um, is that many of the kind of behavioral and mental problems of the past were in the realm of, of psychology or demonic possession, for that matter, until the, the biological underpinning was found, whether it is um, the spirochete in the case of syphilis or something else. So it's a very unstable boundary to put into a law, especially at a time of sort of uh, pro rapidly progressing science. Um, and the reason why it ends up mattering, and this is something I'd love to ask any of you who might know about this or work in this area, is the reason this is in the Act is it says that there can be no substitute consent to psychosurgery as defined in the Act. So no DBS can be provided to someone who's unable to consent for themselves. So no child and no uh, incompetent person. And one can see why this is. It's the history of the 20th century lobotomy in North America where there was sort of an open season, unregulated use of the lobotomy, um, which has led to this kind of cultural reaction of great concern. And I've spent some time recently looking around at the laws throughout um, the British Commonwealth and in the United States and find similar patterns there. And it's causing some problems as DBS research moves into the realm of psychiatric conditions. And in particular, I think, for treatment of aggressive and autoaggressive -aggress disorders that might be um, present in the case of people with intellectual disabilities. And it's interesting that all of the papers I read of attempting to use DBS to treat people in this condition, with these conditions, are coming all out of Italy, uh, Europe, essentially, because many of our laws would, would, would forbid that kind of research. So I'd, be, I'd love to talk to anyone who might be interested in that. And the other problem with this, of course, is that it kind of misses the point. If our concern is with the vulnerability of the subject, well, it's not that we're doing um, sort of research, or I should say uh, implantation of DBS for an organic disorder versus a non-organic disorder. It's the concern about their ability to consent altogether. So really we're distinguishing and changing the regulation uh, based on um, something that really is irrelevant to the actual concern underlying the law. So this is a, an instance where advances in the science might put increasing pressure on this, this dualistic um, division that exists within our laws. So a third one, and this brings us to the topic that um, Athena was mentioning earlier, is a way in which the, the neuroscientific research is bringing new knowledge that we then have to fit within our existing laws, um, legal paradigms, rules, principles. And so Athena mentioned a couple of questions, ethical questions uh, are, that are raised by this um, sort of detection of covert awareness in a subset of populations thought to be uh, in a vegetative state. And so of course there's a question, should we ask if they want life support removed, uh, withdrawal of life-sustaining treatments? Um, on what basis would we assess their competence? Um, what should be the default? Should we presume 
competence unless otherwise shown, which is what we normally do in the law. Well, we have a population of patients who we know for sure have brain uh, damage. Should we have the, the opposite presumption? And then how would we determine whether they are competent? We have to do that in some way through speaking to them through this awkward um, sort of manner of communication. But even beyond the questions of consent and competency to consent and how we might assess that, are additional questions of legal questions, which is, does everyone in this position now with a disorder of consciousness have a legal right to a diagnosis informed by this form of treatment? Is this now the possibility that we now know that our diagnose, diagnostic skills under normal conditions are poor mean that everyone should have, have a workup using this technique? How often? And so on. These are all questions that will have to be settled as a matter of um, the standards of medical practice for medical professional negligence purposes. Um, and also there's implications for the states, uh, the state in other words, um, in terms of the funding allocation made available for uh, this kind of um, diagnostic tool. Uh, okay, so here we have in essence an example of a new technique, a new piece of knowledge coming to challenge our questions and practices around consent to treatment, capacity, and the standard of medical care. So a fourth, and we've also talked about this a little bit, um, going in the direction of responsibility just now. And here we have, uh, and this has been actually a very commonly raised feature of law, the field of law and neuroscience. In essence, it is that as we learn more about the biological underpinnings of human behavior, we are going to conclude that in fact our behavior is driven by our biology um, to a large extent beyond our control, and we'll come to question free will, we'll come to question responsibility. So the question fundamentally is, how is one responsible if one's brain made one behave um, in a criminal manner, for example? And this is in some ways not new. Um, if we look through the history of criminology and criminal law, we can see that biological explanations of behavior have been quite appealing for, for I guess, uh, decades, if not several centuries at this point. We can look back to phrenology and Francis Gall and the idea that, um, and Cesare Lombroso in, in Italy, who went and he measured the skulls of criminal offenders within, I think, a Milanese, uh, Milan or Bologna, I can't remember which one, but he measured all kinds of skulls and determined that, in fact, a particular bump here, a configuration of the jaw there was correlated with criminal offending. So there was a criminal biological type, a morphologically uh, identifiable. And, um, and this was a, sort of a, a theory attempting to be able to detect, predict, and understand in some ways the causes of crime. Why is that so appealing? Well, there's a couple of explanations, really. It may be that we sense that biological causal explanations are more humane and progressive. They're better, in other words, than saying you're bad. It feels more merciful, perhaps, to look for explanations external to the person that are the cause of their behavior and the re why they're a problem. It's not their fault. They're sick rather than they're bad. And so that's part of what's going on. Another reason why it might be so appealing is that when you um, come up with a biological explanation for crime, you are, in essence, looking at the individual offender and locating the prime problem within the offender it reduces the extent to which we're obliged to look at society in general. So uh, whether there might be inequality or poverty or other kinds of criminogenic factors that might explain criminal offending. So it's not our problem, us as a society and other members of the community, it's those people that are just kind of broken or faulty biological mechanisms. So it's a means of apportioning responsibility to a place that lets the rest of us off the hook. That might be part of the explanation. And then as a corollary to that, it suggests that the solution is to fix the individual offenders, which they're you know, a small enough group, is cheaper and easier to fix them and to have them bear the costs, so to speak, the downsides of whatever fixes we come up with, rather than having a sort of a wholesale social environmental response to crime. So there's all these reasons, I think, which work underlying why we might find it rather interesting and appealing to gravitate toward these explanations. Discrete fixes in individual people, problem within the individual people. So what's been going on with this? Well, we have a couple of cases in Italy in which um, uh, 
the court received evidence, both behavioral genetic evidence of the MAOA allele, the so-called warrior gene in the popular press, as well as functional magnetic resonance imaging workup of offenders to conclude that they had a predisposition to impulsive violence, and then this was then used to reduce the sentence, the punishment applicable. Because when we are looking at responsibility and capacity for responsibility, it operates at two stages. The first one is, is there guilt? And it's very, very hard to avoid responsibility altogether. You have to show a complete lack of capacity in essence. Um, but at the second stage, after you've been found guilty, there's a question of what sentence, what punishment to apply. And there again, your capacity for control, predisposing factors are relevant and are interpreted um, sort of biological causal factors as well as environmental and social factors are interpreted as diminishing responsibility if they make it harder, for example, for you to avoid criminal offending. So most of the cases where we see this kind of evidence coming through are at that second stage of determining degree of responsibility for purposes of punishment. And what, <clears throat> what we've been finding is revealed in the next slide. I did a study of um, about six years of Canadian criminal cases to find out, well, what kind of neuroscientific evidence is being used in criminal courts and what's its impact? Because you might think um, that this evidence would actually be beneficial for the offenders, that you would say, well, so-and-so has this kind of brain dysfunction and uh, therefore is less responsible, should receive a lesser punishment. And yes, you do find that pattern for offenses that are not very serious. But when you get into the realm of various serious offenses, a countervailing interpretation is put on the information. So you may, for someone who's committed very serious, dangerous personal injury offenses, say, well, yeah, the poor person, they're less responsible, that's true, in terms of their ability to control themselves, but actually we're more afraid of them. We think our prognosis and treatment is poor. We think recidivism risk is high. They've shown themselves to be very dangerous. Within the sentencing decision, there's several inconsistent objectives being pursued. One is to tailor the punishment to the crime, but there's also to protect society from a dangerous person. And in the context of dangerous offenses, we flip into the dominant mode being that of protecting society. And so you actually see a pattern of what's been described as the double-edged sword of neuroscientific evidence, where you might, yes, reduce moral blame, but increase judgments of dangerousness, and then end up in situations where people are being indefinitely detained. And uh, I understand from this article I put up here about the French context, that there is, um, since 2008 in France, the possibility of a rétention en sécurité, I think, which is, in essence, a finding that someone is to be detained indefinitely after the conclusion of their sentence while they remain a danger to society. So the possibility of indeterminate detention based on prospective judgments of dangerousness. And that is a place where we see some of this evidence coming in. Um, and so it's an interesting question of whether and when, from the perspective of the ethics of the, the defense lawyer, whether you should be pursuing this kind of evidence. It probably depends very much on the existence of credible options for treatment and risk management, as well as on the seriousness of the offense. A fifth possible um, impact, uh, which I think is interesting as well, is the possibility of self-fulfilling uh, prophecies or, uh, yeah, self-fulfilling prophecies at the psychological level of the stories we tell about people within the law. So within so social psychology, there's a very um, commonly doc documented and very rep well replicated phenomenon of the golem effect also known as the Pygmalion effect, also known as labeling, stereotype threat, and so forth, um, to explain performance as a function of expectations about that performance. So, for example, looking at performance of racial minorities or women on math tests, you find that ingoing expectation uh, that they will perform uh, worse is borne out um, in the results. Ingoing expectation they'll be about the same, well, lo and behold, they do, they do better. So this functions both at the social level in terms of the way we treat people, but also at, uh, as an internalized kind of factor. People tend to expect less of themselves and perform less well. So in essence, the stories we're telling biologically about people may actually have this sort of self-fulfilling kind of impact. We're telling people a story which is interpreted as a kind of um, an essentialist 
fundamental immutable biological fact, which then affects their subsequent behavior. And this becomes um, kind of intriguing in the context of criminal law. And I refer you to this case from 2007 in Canada where the defense was arguing, we should have a functional magnetic resonance imaging fMRI workup of this offender. This was a dangerous offender context, a very serious offense, because he may, it may not be his fault. And there was a discussion replicated in the judgment from the judge, which said, well, wait a minute. Is there a risk here of telling the offender there's something wrong with your brain? Is he going to say, well, it wasn't me that did it, it was my brain? Or it wasn't me that did it, it was the drug you gave me that was not working. A kind of an externalization of responsibility that will make it harder, harder for him to actually avoid recidivating in future. In other words, are we telling him a story about his fundamental identity that will make it harder for him to maintain self-control and to forge a new pro-social identity for himself once he's out of jail? And a lot of the, the research on um, what's called desistance, which is uh, desisting from a path of crime, emphasizes the importance at the psychological level of this forging of a new pro-social identity, the non-criminal identity. And if you've told someone that biologically they have this propensity, do you sort of paradoxically undermine their ability to avoid that in future? So this, this is also a, a subject in mental health stigma, the idea of whether we should be telling people that they, uh, their mental disorder is biological or not. What kind of impact does it have on people going forward and their self-efficacy? So I think, I mean, all of this is, it plays upon people's sort of lack of understanding of the distinction between them or not between the mental and the biological and the degree to which the mental uh, experience can affect the biological and back and forth. I think this points to this as being an important um, subject uh, where education is required of the public and of judicial actors to make sure this information coming from neuroscience doesn't have these kinds of unintended social consequences. This, by the way, I love this. Uh, it's from Popular Mechanic, Popular Science in the, I think in the 40s. Have you a wrong way brain? We were looking at that way back then as well. So another uh, instance in which um, neuroscience is being is affecting legal systems in, I think, interesting and troubling ways is the incorporation of neurological interventions within the criminal justice system. And this is an area where I'm doing a lot of research at the moment, uh, speaking to sex offenders, about 15 so far, female offenders, forensic psychiatrists, a whole range of people about a particular phenomenon in criminal justice. And that is the following. When someone is being sentenced um, for a crime, and there's a concern that they're dangerous. So we can imagine, for, for example, um, a re repeat sexual offender. <clears throat> and it, especially facing a possible indeterminate detention, it becomes extremely important to convince the judge that the person has taken responsibility, acknowledges um, the wrongdoing, and that there are means of treatment which are liable to reduce risk. This is, this is sort of the essential inquiry at the dangerousness assessment stage. And a very, very important part of showing that you've taken responsibility and that there is a, um, a reasonable prospects for successful treatment and reduction of recidivism risk is showing compliance with treatment. So in um, many uh, Western countries, um, there's the use of anti-androgen therapy, um, also known as chemical castration, the reduction of testosterone through um, hormonal treatment. And the... the Essentially what happens is the forensic psychiatrist may recommend that this be done for an offender. The defense lawyer will be quite aware that we have to, we have to put forward a pretty good case here to convince the judge you're not a risk anymore. There'll be some sort of discussion. Well, okay, what can we do? Get you into treatment, do this, 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 so we can put our best case forward. And so the, the offender is standing there and has a decision to make. I'm facing potentially indeterminate detention, or I can throw everything I can at trying to show that I'm not a risk, which will include consenting to these kinds of hormonal treatments or other, other treatments. And so, in a way, it's an offer you cannot refuse, right? Especially if the sentence that, you're being, uh, that you are liable to receive is, is a large one. And um, so, there's only, I think, one way to describe this kind of consent that's given. There's, it's a consent under a certain form of duress. Some might call it coerced, some might call it encouraged, and so forth. Um, 
And so it, to me, it raises rather interesting questions. One, what kinds of treatment offers can we put to a person in this circumstance and for, uh, for a permissible, legitimate offer? And second, if you're the psychiatrist receiving the consent from a person in these circumstances, how does this fit with your clinical ethics in terms of treating only patients who are requesting treatment for you know, a therapeutic uh, medical problem versus being driven by the fear of uh, indefinite incarceration? How do we fit these two together? And what we have is the, the blending of the medical this is Foucault, I love it, blending the medical and the, um, the judicial carceral power of the state together into one uh, system in which nobody really has full control of it. And there's many other potential uh, vac uh, sort of interventions that are on the horizon raising these questions. So other surgical interventions likely to be uncommon because of the expense, but a possibility. Um, Vaccines, uh, lots of research now, um, I'm not up to date exactly where it is now, but many clinical trials into anti-cocaine vaccines, for example. I can see a medical or a justice system being very attracted by that. After all, it's an, an injection you provide intermittently. You don't have to watch the person and make sure they're continually taking drugs um, if it were to work. And a range of other forms of treatments that we could find ourselves offering to offenders to deal with behavioral problems associated with criminal offending. And so where would one go to look for limits on this practice? If I say something's illegitimate or legitimate, on what kind of criteria am I basing that decision? And so you could say, well, let's look at human rights laws and say we have a proscription on cruel and unusual punishment. Is an offer of this type a form of cruel and unusual punishment within the criminal frame? Um, one could also look at the clinical ethical perspective. Is this a sufficiently autonomous consent? And the research I've done talking to forensic psychiatrists about this has been extremely illuminating. There's um, many reactions from psychiatrists to try to uh, essentially resolve this dissonance or conflict between this kind of coerced consent and the requirement to provide treatment only to autonomously consenting patients. And so some will say, well, the person who has a, a paraphilia is actually to be understood as a diseased person and we are in treating him releasing him into the real person he really is. We're taking away an impediment that uh, is actually not part of who he, his sort of, um, sort of essential self. Another might say, well, we change all the time. Sometimes the direction of change is good. Others will say something like, well, I'm uncomfortable with him being pressured this way, but as long as he has a mixed motive, as long as he thinks there's a problem and he's doing it to fix that, it's okay if he also is doing it under threat from the state to try to avoid a punishment. Or another will say, well, what should I do? If I refuse to treat him because I don't think he's sufficiently autonomous in his consent, I'm abandoning my patient who's come to me for help um, to face the full wrath of the state with no assistance. I could be actually liable for not providing the assistance required. So you can see the very many different ways that the psychiatrists seek to resolve this ethical dilemma that they feel. And there's a range of, of um, other similar um, kind of ways to try to get around this. Um, so I think it's an interesting area, especially as um, our neurological interventions, whether pharmacological, the surgical, or the brain stimulatory levels advance, um, trying to decide which of them are we going to incorporate into our system of um, rehabilitating criminals in this inherently coercive context. Um, by the way, I would add one thing. If you were listening to me say, well, a treatment offer, that's cruel and unusual punishment, and you might be saying, hey, wait a minute, that's not punishment at all, that's an offer. That's just increasing someone's options. How can that, in fact, be a harm to them? We do have a Canadian case to that effect saying it's not an option, it's a choice. But keep in mind the following case, which I found uh, from the United States, of a man facing a very long sentence, uh, somewhere in the um, 55 or so years for multiple sexual assaults, the judge flippantly, not seriously, said, well, if you will go and get physically castrated, then I'd be willing to um, suspend your prison term. To which the man said, this sounds great. Sign me up. I much prefer physical castration to 55 years in jail. And the judge at this point said, oh, wait a minute. I don't really know if I can make this offer. I, re I re retract the offer. And the reason this case got reported into the, the, the reports of, of judicial decisions was it was the offender himself who sued to reinstate the offer. All this to show that 
a state can convert a choice, uh, in essence, into uh, essentially not a choice by making the alternative sufficiently horrible. And if the state were able to avoid the control of um, like the rule against cruel and unusual punishment by merely providing a sufficiently horrible alternative, it would be a very easy way to get around that uh, prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment. So I think it still remains a, sort of a valid frame within which to look at this phenomenon. Okay, um, I just want to give you one last, that we're doing just fine, I think. Someone will tell me if I've overstayed my time. One last history story from the United States, which I'm hoping will show you that as strange as this sounds, like are we really going to be doing DBS on criminals? I want to take you back to the lobotomy in the courts in 1948 was this case, just to show that um, the things that we're struggling with now, um, the evaluation of the lobotomy, a point was made earlier this morning that the lobotomy looked pretty good in 1930 and 1950 when there weren't any alternatives. In fact, when he's got the Nobel Prize for it. Um, a lot of our contemporary treatments look pretty good too now. And for somebody with an intellectual disability who is being restrained chemically or physically, I have DBS for aggression looks pretty good to me too now. So let's go back to Millard Wright, the recidivist house thief in 1948, California. So this is an old article I found, um, print, uh, the citations at the bottom written by a man who was a supervising director of the behavior clinic of the criminal court in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, um, director of mental health clinic, psychiatrist to the juvenile court, who was a forensic psychiatrist. And he's writing this article about a patient. <clears throat> a pretrial petition asked for the court's consent for a prefrontal lobotomy, also known as leucotomy, to be performed on one, upon one Millard Wright to cure him of his criminal tendencies i.e. breaking into houses and stealing things. And it goes on to explain that the defense, with the agreement of the prosecutor, the district crown attorney, asked the court that he be allowed to leave jail to go to hospital to get this lobotomy. And it goes on and says the kind and humane judge before the whom the petition was presented agreed. And he went off, and uh, the language is, is just is such interesting, rich language to look back at this historically. The judge was willing to help a human being to reestablish himself in society if it were possible to do so, even though he had no precedent for granting a petition for experimental treatment. So he went off and he had the lobotomy. Right before the trial was over, was quoted as saying, I hope the judge will give me the opportunity to prove that surgery can change a man's personality. The judge on the other, it turns out it didn't really work. The judge said, wait a minute, how do I know this actually worked? You're going to jail anyway. So ultimately the gambit did not work. He, uh, and he ultimately, uh, Millard Wright uh, ultimately killed himself. Um, but the last line, surgeons are being swamped by demands for this operation by alcoholics, criminals, so and so and so and so. Um, an interesting moment in, in American history. We don't have as much uh, of the same thing in Canada, but we have had some, some of this as well. So that brings me to the conclusion. I hope I've, I've shown you that in many of these ways, whether it's at the level of evidence law, at the level of incorporation of interventions, or even at the level of just learning information about ourselves, about the extent to which we have free will, the meaning of free will, um, how we incorporate rights around access to these kinds of uh, emerging treatments into our standard, gold standard medical treatments, there's many, many legal questions that are coming up that are extremely rich and interesting. I hope you find. Okay, so thank you for this very nice talk. And now we have several minutes for questions. So, yes. Uh, thank you, Janet. I was just wondering, like, um, do you have any <clears throat> any picture of uh, of those people that they refer to the brain damage or brain uh, state or mental state as an excuse not to be sentenced? What were the um, the cases? There were criminal law, but what were they accused of? Oh, a whole range of different things. So. Um there's one case, uh, the one I mentioned earlier this morning of a, this is a little bit different. This was um, a woman who'd taken the, uh, the dopamine uh, therapy who 
that this was a case of uh, drunk driving. Uh, other cases where this comes up, I'm thinking back in my, my data set of the five years of cases, uh, there's a whole range of different things. Generally, this kind of argument was coming up in uh, violent offenses, whether murders, homicides of different types, um, violent assaults. There were occasionally uh, references in drug cases as well, um, and a couple of robberies, but largely it was violent offending. It, the evidence was being used to suggest um, impaired impulse control or aggressivity, much of the time. Uh, I wonder how you, we can uh, address this paradoxical situation you raised when you are at court and there's a risk of informing um, the person that he has a disease or something that could be used to explain his uh, behavior, but in another hand, if he's not informed, how can you possibly imagine he wouldn't do it again? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you... I mean, it's really a situation where you need to inform them so that they can take action to try to treat and prevent the next uh, action to happen. I, I suspect it's going to be something like this, and you will, you will all know better than I do how, how to frame this and whether, whether there's evidence for what I'm saying. But I suspect the danger lies in our tendency to be uh, towards psychological essentialism. We, we tend to regard genes, anything biological, as immutable and fundamental about the identity and characteristics of the person. We don't understand about plastic, plasticity of the brain. We don't understand how cognitive behavioral therapy might work, perhaps, to remodel pathways in the brain. I think that any story that says this past behavior was a function of um, this brain damage or this neurodevelopmental problem needs to be married with, to the extent that it exists, some story about how that is not necessarily um, sort of a life sentence, that there are possibilities for modifying or constraining the risk or behavior. Um, so that the person doesn't see themselves as irrevocably and unchangeably kind of damaged in that way. So there has to be a, a, some sort of positive story at the same time. And I think that will be rather difficult because it will depend upon whether that actually exists. So in my data set, um, and this is a very interesting difference from all of my colleagues who were doing it in different countries, Netherlands, the UK, uh, um, Australia, Singapore, and uh, the US. Something that was raised in a huge number of my cases was fetal alcohol exposure. So this is something that has been incorporated into Canadian law for a variety of historical reasons and uh, is very front and center. We even have bills in parliament to modify the criminal code to address fetal alcohol um, effect driven offending. And some people say, well, why just this form of brain damage? Why not all of them? And no, no, we're focused on fetal alcohol exposure. Um, but the problem there is what, what are the treatment options available um, for damage that is caused in that way? Um, so I think that it may be an answer to your question. It may be impossible to resolve that paradox for some cases at present. Um, but to the extent possible, um, the person the person's agency should be supported and encouraged so that whatever realm of actual control they retain is given the best possible chance of, uh, of success. That's what I would suggest. But I'm, I should say I'm not a psychologist, and I'm not a psychiatrist, so I don't really know how much this story will affect offenders, nor do I know how much of my recommended positive story will actually palliate uh, those concerns. That would be for others than me to find out, I think. Sorry, I just uh, wonder about the cases where uh, older people do some other, uh, some criminal cases or some other criminal offenses. Is it because of their um, old age or the state of their mind or the state of their brain is going damaged? So they have to prove that, okay, I'm getting old, so my brain is being, um, it's not efficient as uh, uh, what I am supposed to do. Uh, so that's why I did this offense. So it's so mm -hmm. easy to develop. Well, what it just is uh, to prove or to get away from the cases. So, so your focus is on, um, on old age and dementias yes. and yes. degenerative conditions. Yeah, there are cases like that in, in, the, in the set for sure. So um, I, I recall coming across a Huntington's uh, case as an explanation for behavior or a frontotemporal uh, dementia. Or there, these are raised um, occasionally uh, to explain criminal behavior. And uh, in those cases, you're almost, they're almost stronger cases because you have a prior 
often length, lengthy history of non-offending. And then all of a sudden this sort of change in behavior. And so there's a kind of a correlation between sort of the signs of the disease manifesting and then this degradation in the behavior and the causal explanation is more persuasive. It's, it's harder when you have um, someone who's younger, which happens to coincide with the age period of maximal criminal offending as well, um, sort of explaining that, no, this person is damaged as opposed to just being a bad person. Um, but yeah. So, the, so it, it could be proved that, okay, so this person is going to be in a dementia state, so his case could be uh, treated as a dementia case, or so he could be yeah. getting rid of this. So uh, it, it would work in the following way. If he is already so demented that he would um, be said not to retain cognitive capacity, the capacity for criminal responsibility, he probably, either his case would be diverted and he would be in the mental health system, or he would be found not guilty and then end up where appropriate with some level of supervision if necessary. Um, but if retained sufficient capacity to be held responsible, it might, the discussion might then be, well, his level of moral responsibility was low because of diminished capacity and he doesn't really pose that much danger going forward because his capacity is declining and would tend to not receive as sort of heavy a pen penalty. Um, one last question. Yeah. Thank you for this very interesting talk. Uh, this morning and this afternoon, you, you deal as a lawyer with free will. Mm -hmm. But some neuroscientists, and that's an emerging field now, are telling us that there is nothing such as a free will. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with that? You know, yeah. it's, it's really important. Oh, yeah. So uh, the funny thing is we all act and behave and feel in our hearts like we have free will. <laughs> You, what, even if we're a neuroscientist who thinks there's no such thing, we still act like we have free will. Um, so, and this is an area of lots of discussion amongst law and neuroscientists. And it's more often the scientists who say, oh, there's no such thing as free will. We should completely overhaul criminal justice. We should get, do away with our social practice of blaming people. It makes no sense. It's incoherent. We're all clockwork mechanisms. So why do we have this social thing called blame anyway? We should turn it all into a therapeutic control modal. And the, the, I guess the thing I'd say, I'd say two things about that. The first thing is, it's not clear to me that that's actually more humane and progressive because we've had uh, experiences with the more rehabilitation therapy model of criminal justice in the past. And it's actually often much better just to take the particular blame you get and penalty, which ends up being shorter often than the lengthy period during which you might fall under the jurisdiction of the doctors to fix you. And so the point is, and, and you see very frequently in the criminal cases that people who could access an insanity plea do not do so because it's way better to go and spend your week in jail or whatever than end up perhaps indefinitely in the care of the psychiatrist. So there's that one point that just if we're motivated out of concern for offenders, which may not be, but let's assume we are, we might not want to actually get rid of moral blame. It might be better a response from, for them. Now, setting that aside for the moment to the debate that's going on in law and neuroscience, <clears throat> there is a su suggestion that it's incoherent. It makes no sense. Our practice of moral blame makes no sense. We should just get rid of it. But in a way that mischaracterizes what we're, you know, in a certain way what we're doing in the law. Because in the law, what, we don't ask anything about free will. We ask, did you have the capacity to understand what you're doing? And that's different. Because an organism that can perceive signals from the environment and respond to them in a mechanistic way could be said to have the capacity uh, on, on those sort of skeletal terms. So it's actually possible to have a criminal justice system um, function as it does now, even if we have no free will. We will threaten those who are sufficiently responsive to social cues to respond to them, and we won't threaten those who are not responsive because of defective ability to perceive and understand. So the legal system can persist. Now, I think sometimes that argument is taken too far because the fact of the matter is we all feel that there's a moral blame component to it that gives its, its legitimacy. And it may be that we'll have to be a little more kind of flexible about our insistence on that component. But I, I think it's a really interesting question. And by the way, it doesn't um, extend only to criminal blame. I've just finished a paper which looks at the same thinking around our willingness to recognize disability. Now disability, the definition of disability is really important in legal systems for access to social solidarity support, protection from discrimination in employment, all these things. 
And here again, we ask questions about um, level of control, and we can see the use of the brain disease model of all kinds of things, not just addiction, but pathological gambling, internet addiction, sex addiction, are all being framed as diseases of the brain now in order to access our sense that somehow it's not their fault. So we can see the similar pattern of thinking playing out all over the place, not just in terms of moral blame, but also in access to social solidarity, protection from discrimination, and so forth. So I think it's a, we're going to see all kinds of tentacles of this, this level of thinking about responsibility, control, and capacity pervading many of our social institutions. Thank you a lot for this uh, nice talk. Mm -hmm.